For our presentation, we chose dermatophytosis. This is a type of fungal infection of the skin, hair, and nails. This type of dermatophilic organism stays superficial in the skin layers. And the one that we're going to focus on more so in this presentation is the most common for our dogs and cats, Microsporum canis, which we'll go over in detail just a little bit later. The veterinary importance for this uh, organism, there are zoonotic factors, and we can typically see the skin lesions not only on the animals, but also on the owners. So we're going to go through this presentation talking about the different presenting signs, information about the organism, what we typically try and do as a diagnostic tools, and then some treatment information. Dermatophytosis is caused by a parasitic fungus that ultimately um, attacks the structures of the skin um, and hair. And the most common um, fungus is the microsporum family. Um, in particular, microsporum canis is the most common in both cats and dogs. Whenever we are seeing small animals, the most common species is going to be the trichophyton, uh, mentagrophytes, um, whereas, like I said, the cats and dogs are generally going to be that microsporum canis. These patients that we see come into the hospital, majority of them have very similar looking lesions, same characteristics of the hair loss, scaling and crusting, plus or minus some erythemia. There can be some pigmentation changes. We can also see some drying and looks of, you know, epidermal, epidermal cholerets. We do see some patients who have little to no pruritus, and then there can be also some severe cases for pruritus. Um, so no patient's going to be the exact same, but they, a lot of them still have the similar presentations of that focal or generalized lesions and alopecia. Most of the time we're going to see these kinds of lesions on the face, ears, legs, tail, plus or minus the trunk. But there also can be patients within households that can be asymptomatic carriers. So those would be a little bit harder to diagnose. A lot of times when we are trying to diagnose these patients for dermatophytosis, we utilize not only the tests, but also history and clinical signs. Where are these patients living? Um, did they just get adopted? We also have some signalments that are a little bit more common to have this kind of organism. So we're looking at really young kittens or older animals and even some immunosuppressed animals. The long hair that may be hiding some of these lesions as well. So we're just talking with the owner and getting that information about environment um, and just thinking about the signalment of the patient when they come in. A lot of times what we do with these patients is a woods lamp examination. We can also do a fungal culture and then taking samples from the lesion itself and looking underneath the microscope and trying to find those organisms. Also, we can use the owner's lesions. Um, so visualizing and seeing the lesion on the owner and then kind of combining that with history and clinical signs. When we are trying to identify these organisms underneath the microscope, it's important to make sure that we're collecting the correct sample from the lesion, typically trying to use the crusting and scaling um, that is on the outer edges of these lesions. And we can collect those with hemostats and we can kind of prep it on a slide to take a look. There's also the possibility of taking a sample from the auger dish with the DTMs, which we'll discuss, but taking a growth sample from that dish and using that sample to look underneath the microscope. You can also use some adhesive tape to collect your sample. The stain typically used for identification of these um, organisms, uh, we use lactophenol, lactophenol stain. This helps because it 
puts a blue color to the cytoplasm that helps with recognition. A very common tool that we use to diagnose uh, microsporum canis is the Woods lamp examination. This is, has the ultraviolet light that helps identify the microsporum canum canis by looking at the me metabolic products of this type of organism. When we're doing research and talking about this type of microorganism, yeah. we should not allow a negative Woods lamp exam to determine the possibility of the patient having this. And what we'll see on some of the examinations, like you see in the picture, we have hair shafts that will glow. We don't typically see it in the crusting area, but more the hair shafts itself. Um, we can also utilize this tool with monitoring the progression of treatment to see if we are having less and less fluorescing lesions. And then, pop quiz, can you guess what percentage of microsporum canis fluoresces? Is it 1, 30%, is it 40%, 50%, or 60%? I will give you a brief pause to try and answer. So the answer is actually only 50%. And so that's why we talk about not utilizing this as our only means of diagnosis when we see that negative Woods lamp, because there's a possibility that some of the organisms will not fluoresce, excuse me. And that's going to be 50% of these patients. The other type of diagnostic tool that we spoke about is a fungal culture. This is something where we take the samples and apply it to this auger dish um, that will change colors with certain contaminants in certain organisms. So we can take samples from the lesions, the outer lesion, outer area lesions with a clean, mic, um, a clean hemostat, or lots of studies recommend using a toothbrush. So finding a brand new toothbrush to scrape the area of the lesion and then applying that to the uh, DTM, the uh, plate that we use. You have to keep in mind, this is something that does take some time. So we typically keep this plate at room temperature and every day we're monitoring it to check and see if there's any color changes. Now we have to be careful because there are some contaminants that can change in the same color that we would see um, dermatophytosis. And so that would mimic our dermatophytosis, but actually be a a false positive. So that's why it's always nice to take additional samples and look underneath the microscope to see is this contamination, is this the type of organism that we're looking for. Um, so just keep that in mind. Another note is that some of the um, dermatophyte organisms can appear differently. So they may not always come out as the red color that you can see in the image. They can uh, present in different ways on the medium. This is a short informational video. You can see progression over time of the DTM dermatophyte testing medium going through its growth phase. Hi, I'm John Plan of Skin Vet Clinic. Dogs, cats, and especially kittens can get a skin disease called ringworm. Ringworm is a fungal infection of the skin and hair related to athlete's foot in people. It may cause circular lesions from which it gets its name, but it usually looks different in dogs and cats. People can catch it from their pets. When we suspect that ringworm is a possibility, we will often perform a DTM fungal culture. The hair is inoculated into a special growth media with a color indicator. These time-lapsed images will show you what a positive ringworm culture looks like as it grows. Ringworm organisms utilize protein before carbs, which results in an early color change compared to other fungi. Here you see a DTM plate with the growth and color change characteristic of ringworm. It often takes one or two weeks for this to happen. At SkinVet, we will also confirm these findings with a microscopic examination of the fungal growth as shown here. The different species of ringworm can be identified based on the appearance of the culture plate and the microscopic characteristics. 
This is just one example of the expertise available at SkinVet Clinic. Whenever discussing dermatophytosis, one of the considerations to help in the prevention is through nutritional. So the biggest portion is we want to make sure that the skin integrity is staying healthy. We want to make sure that coat is nice and healthy, staying clean, not getting dried, cracked. And this comes from a food that is nutritionally adequate, making sure that it has all the vitamins, minerals that are required for that type of pet, whether it's cats, dog, or if it's a small animal. Sometimes we may even use um, additional supplements like an omega-3 fatty acid supplement because that, those fish oils help um, with coat and skin health. And so these can then make sure that the skin and hair coat are not at risk for becoming um, infected with the um, ringworm uh, fungus. Dermatophytosis is primarily going to be treated um, by making sure that any patient um, that is currently active with an infection is separated from not only immunocompromised um, people in the household, but we also want to make sure that any other animals are also separated from this pet, the pet. Um, because this is a zoonotic disease that can be passed from animal to animal, animal to human, human to animal, and so we want to limit the exposure. And that's one of the top um, things that it's done during treatment. Um, a lot of times we don't want to use things like immunosuppressive drugs or steroids because these then cause the fungus to populate even more. Uh, generally, the entire um, household is going to be treated, not just the pet that is effective, um, as well as um, making sure that the full environment is taken care of. And then lastly, there are some pharmaceutical options that will be utilized in the primary treatment. So during the primary treatment portion, um, pharmaceutical treatments are available. There are two that are primarily utilized, the itraconazole and the grisofulvin. However, itraconazole is generally the main one that we're going to utilize. It is very effective for our dermophytosis. Um, it's only labeled for cats. So whenever you have a dog, it will get used for the dogs, but it is considered off-label. Now, the um, grisofulvin, it is off-label off use only. It's not labeled for animals at all. And the big reason it's not utilized that often or much is for the simple fact that it's not as effective as itraconazole. So as long as the, the patient can handle the itraconazole, it is still the better option for our pharmaceutical treatments. Now, some other treatments, um, supportive care treatments that we will use are we're ultimately going to make sure that we clip all the hair um, in that vicinity of the lesion. So if there is a, a lesion in one area, we want to make sure that we can not only just visualize the lesion, but we also have um, a good margin around it of nice, healthy skin that helps get the hair away so any medications um, or the shampoos can actually get to that area. Then we're going to um, bathe them. This is pretty common in our cats and dogs. However, whenever it comes to um, our small animals, we actually do not want to bathe them because bathing them um, tends to cause increase in stress. And this is something that can be life-threatening in our small animals. Um, sometimes the um, shampoos that will be used will be made from a chlorhexidine and a myconazole um, combination. And these are licensed for um, dermatophytosis, and they basically um, reduce the spread of the fungus, but also increases the patient's comfort that way 
they're not scratching and causing um, self trauma. There are some creams gels, but they're rarely effective. And that's because usually the pet will groom the product off of them. Whereas the shampoos, um, they sit and soak on the pet for a certain amount of time and then they're rinsed away. So they're not being groomed away by the animal. Dermatophytosis or ringworm is a pretty big zoonotic disease. Now, whenever it comes to who, what type of pets can trans, transmit or transfer the fungal disease between um, kind of varies. Now with cats, they're the big vessel for ringworm. They can transfer it and carry it because they're not the final host for that fungus. Whereas canines, um, once the fungus is in the dog, that's it. That's the end of its life. Once, once it, um, its life cycle ends, that it stops there. It doesn't just keep going. So generally cats are linked more to the zoonotic aspect of ringworm versus dogs. Dogs are a little less common to transfer it zoonotically, but it's still possible. And then small animals, it's even more common because what happens is the small animal has the lesion and children are playing with the pet or maybe an immune compromised person is playing or cuddling the pet. Maybe they don't see it or they don't pay attention or a lot of times you don't even know it is there until it's progressed and gotten larger. And so the small animals and then the felines, those are generally where we see that zoonotic transfer from the animal to the humans and then also can go from the human to another human, human to another pet, and it just kind of goes back and forth in the environment. Dermatophytosis is extremely common whenever we are dealing with a cattery, which is a boarding facility for cats or in a breeding colony. So a breeder who has a set breeding um, group of cats. And basically what happens is since cats are one of the top transmitters of the ringworm fungus, it just flies almost from one to the other. It doesn't literally fly it's from contact, but it moves through these catteries and colonies pretty quickly. And so it has to be caught extremely fast. Otherwise, an entire colony can become infested. Um, it's not really necessarily more common in one area than in other. Um, it's mostly just the type of environment, um, the catteries, the breeding colonies, um, areas that maybe are uncleanly or even that are not up, to, the upkeep is not kept up to par because um, maybe the grass is overgrown and so the cat <laughs> is in the grass, the whole tile, taller grasses in the dirt and that's where they um, get that fungus on them. With dermatophytosis or ringworm, the likelihood of the pet getting over the disease and returning to normal, um, it kind of varies. Now, if it's in a household where maybe there's, you know, a single cat or kitten, then it's pretty good. They're, with treatment, generally we have good outcome. However, in breeding colonies and catteries, that's when it gets a little guarded because it can then lead to other diseases or other issues that take advantage of the body being compromised by the fungal disease. Um, now, if we can determine the actual source, so maybe it's a patch of grass that's tall and a bunch of dirt that the cats are getting into, or maybe the sandbox, and we can treat it, then again, we have that good um, possibility of outcome. However, if we can't figure out where 
the fungal infection is coming from. Um, again, we're, we have that guarded prognosis because if we can't get rid of it, then it's just going to keep coming back and coming back and coming back, and it's going to leave the body exposed and compromised, and then other diseases can take advantage of that, um, the body being struggling. Now, with our small animals, so not our cats or dogs, but our smaller animals, rabbits and other things like that, that's whenever it's guarded because the treatment for it and what is generally needed causes more stress than their bodies are used to and even maybe able to handle. Um, because a lot of times we have to shave and bathe these animals that get ringworm. Um, and so, you know, you have a rabbit, they don't handle being shaved and they really don't handle being bathed. So a lot of times we have a guarded prognosis or possibility of outcome um, with those small animals. Just some additional information to reiterate. We want to make sure that we are cleaning the environments, not only taking care of the patient's skin. The environments we have to take care of and think of because these spores of the organism can stay there for a period of time. So you're talking about the bedding, you're talking about furniture, carpets, brushes that are used on these patients. So making sure that we are not only taking care of the patient, but also looking at the environment that these patients are in. Is this patient outdoors? then this patient may be more susceptible to the organism. Our cats are more susceptible than dogs, typically. And so making sure the owner understands this treatment can take some time. We need to make sure that we are taking care of the environment and then also trying to maintain a healthy, well-balanced diet so our patient's skin and coat are healthy.